good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship service this morning as we celebrate the first Sunday in Lent. A special welcome to our visitors. If you're new in the Springfield Clark County area, are looking for a new church home, invite you to make St. John your new church home. The order of worship is in your bulletin, uh, all the liturgy except for the hymns. So you'll only need the hymn book for the singing of the hymns. You will note that because this is a season of Lent, we have left out several things in the liturgy uh, because it's traditional during Lent to do so. Uh, so don't be surprised when, because we won't sing the hymn of praise, we won't sing uh, Holy, 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 or Lamb of God during the communion liturgy. So I'd ask that you turn to page two, to the order of confession and forgiveness. And I invite those who can do so without a difficulty to please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We are Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We are glad to have you with us today, February 22nd, 2015. This is the first Sunday of Lent. St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Our telephone number is 937-323-7508.
and in the wilderness of temptation, you protected your Son from sin. Renew us in the gift of baptism. May your holy angels be with us, that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gina Pollock will be giving the first reading. A reading from Genesis. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and for your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, and the birds and the domestic animals and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be flood to destroy the water from the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you, for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you, and the, every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, I will see it. And remember the everlasting covenant between God and and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Vicki Perks will be doing the psalm.
when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons were saved in water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. One Sunday morning, the preacher was preaching on temptation. And as he was preaching, he made the comment, quote, Opportunity knocks only once, but temptation bangs on the door all life long. So the question is, how do you resist temptation? What do you do when Satan comes to you to tempt you to do something that you know is wrong? How do you fight it short of death? How do you continue to follow and walk in the ways of the light of Jesus Christ when every day Satan is harassing you with temptation? Sam was having a difficult time abiding by his diet. He was one of those people who could resist everything but temptation. One morning he entered the office and he had a box of freshly baked Danish under his arm. And so his co-workers asked him, but Sam, what about your diet? What are you doing with those Danish? You aren't supposed to be eating those, are you? And Sam replied, he said, well, the only reason I have these Danish this morning is because of God. His co-workers said, what do you mean that the only reason you have these Danish is because of God? What's God got to do with it? He said, well, it was like this. He said, as I drove by the bakery this morning, I prayed, God, if it is your will I have a Danish, please let me find a parking spot right in front of the bakery. And sure enough, as I drove up, there was a spot right in front of the bakery on my eighth trip around the lawn. <laughs> it is difficult to fight temptation. And if we try to fight temptation on our own, we are doomed to fail. At the same time, this is not an excuse, but at the same time, we know that as human beings, we can never be perfect in resisting temptation in this lifetime. That as St. Paul reminds us all too well, that we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. So eventually we're going to give in to some kind of temptation, but it doesn't have to dominate our lives. It doesn't have to control us. We don't have to give in to every temptation that comes rolling down the pipe. So how do we resist temptation? In order to answer that, we go back to our gospel lesson for this morning, to that famous incident in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, his temptation in the wilderness. As we read in our gospel lesson, Jesus had come to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Now in some of the other gospels, they tell us that John protested against baptizing Jesus, saying that Jesus should be baptizing John, not John, Jesus. But Jesus responds that it must be done to fulfill all righteousness, so that he would identify with us as human beings. And then we read, or as we read this morning, after Jesus is baptized, then St. Mark tells us, as do Matthew and Luke, immediately the Spirit drove him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast, and the angels were ministering to him. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. It is important that we understand what's going on here. Were we writing the story? Were we in control? After Jesus' baptism, after the heavens opened up, the uh, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and lighted on his shoulder and the clouds opened and the voice of God said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We would expect then Jesus to do something spectacular in order to affirm what God just said about it. If we were in charge, we would have Jesus feed everybody that was there on the banks of the Jordan with him or some kind of miraculous thing so that anybody that heard God say, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased, we know that God was speaking about Jesus. But God, knowing far more than we do, 
do that for his son to successfully identify with us. For his son to truly be the sacrifice for sin that saves the world. He knew that his son must be tempted just as we are tempted. And so the Holy Spirit drives Jesus out into the wilderness. The Greek word that we translate as drive or drove literally means to thrust somebody in the sun. The Holy Spirit literally thrust Jesus into the wilderness. Jesus had no say in the matter. Jesus didn't say, well, I'm just going to go out here now and walk around in the wilderness for a while. And God, you and I can communicate and I'll think over what about this mission you want to send me on. And uh, after spending some time out here, I'll give you my answer. No, Jesus is thrust into the wilderness. The word also means to impel, to go. So Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, is driven out, impaled, thrust into the wilderness to confront our enemy, Satan. And as we read, 40 days he was there fasting. And then old Satan shows up to try and throw a monkey wrench into God's plan of salvation. Now Mark's account is very short. It just gives us the basic details. So let us turn to the fourth chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew and we read what those temptations were and how Jesus is identifying with us in those temptations and what Jesus does to resist those temptations so that we may follow the example of Jesus and how to resist temptation. As we read uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry, and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command me that these stones become bread. So Satan is attacking Jesus in his weakness. Just like Satan likes to attack you in your weakest point and weakest time. He's asking Jesus to use his power selfishly. To use that power he has from God for the benefit of himself to satisfy a physical desire. And so often that is the way Satan tempts us. It's with some kind of physical desire. Tempts us, as I said, at a weak time with some physical desire, wanting us to give in to him. But Jesus responds by saying, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So how does Jesus resist temptation? By using the word of God. By being grounded in the word of God, by having his foundation in the word of God. And when Satan hears scripture used properly, Satan flees because he has no defense. He cannot combat scripture used properly. So Satan goes away. Then Satan comes back, took him into the holy city, and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Another way that Satan tempts us, by misquoting scripture, by taking scripture out of its context and telling you or tempting you to do something contrary to God's word by misusing that scripture. Here what he wants Jesus to do is to tempt God. Prove that God really has made him the Savior of the world. But Jesus then again fights the devil by using Scripture truthfully and the way it's supposed to be. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus can't make it much clearer. You are to put you are not to put the Lord God to the test. Yet how many times in our earthly lives do we tempt God by doing something we shouldn't do? 
How often do we do something and then expect God to pull our chestnuts out of the fire? Sometimes it's something simple. I can remember my senior year in high school. Um, we, as you know, that I grew up on my grandma's farm through elementary school and the beginning of junior high. And then we moved to Lexington so that my dad he could go to the University of Kentucky and earn his doctorate degree so that he could leave being a principal of a high school that he opened at a brand new high school, leave that and become a college professor. So we lived in Lexington for two years. I loved that. I went to school, and then once he had his doctorate degree, we moved back to Louisville, he became a professor at the University of Louisville. And so I would go out every Saturday and cut the grass on my grandma's farm, which was an all-day job. And I developed a friendship with a buddy and asked him if he would like to help me, because my grandma paid me quite well for cutting the grass on the farm. And, uh, do it together, it will be done quicker and we can split the money. And so it worked out. But well, one day we were driving back from having cut the grass and driving back to the east side of Louisville where we live. And my buddy said to me, hey, why don't you see how fast this car will go? He says, why don't you floor it? So we were on uh, the, uh, the uh, Waterson Expressway. If you're familiar with Louisville, you know what that is. But anyhow, I floored it. I get, this is an old Falcon now. It was a 1969 Ford Falcon. Uh, if you ever had one, I saw the top speed on the thermometer, I think it was about 90. So I got it up to 80. And I'm flying all, past all these cars. And I'd always been one of those people really kind of afraid of speed. Uh, and usually didn't speed, but... With my buddy there you know, encouraging me, there I go. And something told me to slow down. And in just the nick of time, I slowed down. Because when we came down, this kind of grade there sitting in the median was your friendly police officer with a radar gun just waiting to bust some idiot teenager going 80 <laughs> miles in a 55 mile an hour speed zone. Well, see, I was putting God to the test. I was in danger in my life and the life of my buddy counting on God to keep us from having an accident. So that is the way Satan comes. He tempts us to do something to put God to the test. And when you read Jesus' words, on the other hand it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. To this day I don't understand those brothers and sisters in Christ down in the south. Central Kentucky and Eastern Kentucky and down on into Tennessee and West Virginia and North Carolina that in their worship service pull out little ugly old rattlesnakes and water moccasins and hang them on their heads and wrap them all around them and hold them in the three or four in the air and shake them around. If anybody has tend to God, that's tend to God. So Satan will try to get you to tempt God to do something you shouldn't do so God will prove himself. How does Jesus resist it? Again, quoting scripture, relying on God's word. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the whole angels came and began to minister. So Satan will tempt you by offering you all kinds of riches, all kinds of earthly rewards if you just make him your priority instead of our Lord Jesus Christ. But as Jesus said, it is only the Lord our God we are to worship. And so in each and every instance, Jesus resists temptation by using the word of God. And that is how we resist temptation. By our faith in Jesus Christ and using his word to combat Satan. Because Satan always flees when God's word is used correctly.
Now, there are those who say, well, I'm strong enough to resist temptation. I can use my own strength, my own reason, my own rationale, my own intellect. The devil won't get anything over on me. When people have that kind of attitude, Satan just sits back and rubs his hands together and believes. Because he knows he's got you. He knows if you're going to try to confront him with just your reason, your intellect, your rationale, your strength, you're going to fail and fail this way. You're going to fail just like Adam and Eve in the garden. Just like Samson giving in to the temptations of Delilah. Just like the nation of Israel which constantly gave in to the temptations of of their pagan neighbors and incorporated their pagan worship into their worshiping of the true God. You're going to fail just like Peter. Good old Saint Peter. He was relying on his strength. When Jesus told him in the upper room he would be betrayed and handed over to evil men, Saint Peter jumped up and boldly proclaimed, Lord, everybody else can fall away from me. Everybody else can run away from you. But I will stand by you to my death. I will fight with you to the death if it's necessary. But of course, we know how old St. Peter stood up when he was in the courtyard of the high priest. And he is confronted with being a follower of Jesus. He gives in to the temptation to save his own skin to run. And so three times he denies our Lord before the cock crows. Twice, just as Jesus had predicted. So we cannot rely on our own strength. We cannot rely on our own intelligence. We cannot rely on our rationale or our reason. We can't rely on modern technology. We have to rely on our faith in Jesus Christ and rely on the power of God's word using that word correctly to combat Satan. St. Paul, writing his letter to the Ephesians, at the end of that letter in the sixth chapter, tells them to put on the help to gird themselves for battle, spiritual battle, so put on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness. And then he says, and to hold on to the Spirit of the Word, or the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word. To hold on to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word. The Word of God is the sword. It is the sword of the Lord for us to flail away of Satan and his temptation. To thrust, to jab, to fight. With that sword of the word, so that Satan runs away in defeat. But there will be those times that we do fail. There will be those times when we give in to temptation for whatever reason. And when that happens, all is not lost. Because we go to the end of our gospel reading for today. And we read those very comforting and assuring words of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we read, now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. When we fail, when we give into that temptation, then what we do is repent. We confess to God that sin. And because of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of the good news of the gospel, tells us that by confessing and believing in Jesus Christ, our sins are washed away. Because of Jesus' willing death upon the cross, His blood of the sacrifice, His blood of the atonement, His redeeming blood washes us clean, that's clean, as that freshly fallen snow we watched come down yesterday in so many inches. So we do not have to become despondent or discouraged from giving in to temptation, but instead remember that we can, Jesus has given us the gift of 
confession. By confessing, we are forgiven. And forgiven, the slave is washed clean. And God remembers it no more. We human beings, we will forgive somebody. But oftentimes, after forgiving them, we will not hold them as in high esteem. We will not be as confident in them. We will have some doubts about them. Or maybe we'll even break off a relationship, even though we have forgiven them because we just don't trust them anymore. <coughs> Constantly in the back of our mind remembering what it was that we forgave them. But God is not like that. When God says he wipes the slate clean, that's exactly what he means. When Jesus says his death upon the cross pays a debt of sin that we owe so that God sees not a sinner but a child of the Heavenly Father, that is exactly what he means. When Jesus tells us that our hearts need not be troubled because he goes to prepare a place for us, we can take him at his word because he sealed that promise with his blood upon the cross. So how do you resist temptation? You resist it through your faith in Jesus Christ and using God's word as your sword against the devil. But when you do fail, you come to Christ in repentance and the slave is worshiping him. And you still are that child of the heavenly Father. So don't rely on your strength. Don't rely on your reason or rationale. Don't rely on your intellect, but instead, trust in the Word of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please turn to page five in your worship folder. And I invite those who came without difficulty to please stand. And with the whole church, we confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being for the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again and pour him to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. Who has spoken through the prophets? We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we journey through this Lenten season of repentance and renewal, let us turn to God who mercifully gives us new life. Our response today is Your mercy is great. O God of promise, strengthen all the baptized in the covenant you made with us in baptism, and empower us to speak your promises in the wilderness of this world. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. O God of voice and word, speak tenderly to the world that you made, that the nations may know your loving presence, and that their leaders your guiding wisdom. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. O God of patience and kindness, 
to remember those who approach death and strengthen those who keep watch with them. Heal those who are sick and assure them of your abiding presence. Hear us, O God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. O God of our relationships, bless those preparing for baptism. Give holy guidance to those who mentor them and to congregations who will receive them. Hear us, O God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. O God of all eternity, keep our blessed dead in your eternal embrace until with all your saints we are united with them by your grace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Merciful God, hear our cry when we call to you. Renew and uphold us with your spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Even to giving his life. 
And the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is new covenant to my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, O God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. Amen. Come, come, Lord Jesus. Jesus. So now we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance of all your saints in life. Amen. Amen. Come, come, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, our glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus told us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
fire of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. We conclude our celebration with rejoicing pure in heart, hymn number 873, in the back of the worship. Hymn number 873. Thank you for listening to St. John's uh, service today. The 
February 22nd, 2015. This is the first Sunday in Lent. Please call our church if you desire membership or have any questions about our service. You may purchase a Lutheran Book of Worship online and follow us during the service. Our church also offers a Christian school program for ages 3 and 4, nursery and pre-K. For more information, you may call the school office at 937-325-4311. I hope and pray that God will continue to bless you and keep you this day and all your days. We'll pray for you, continue to pray for us, and support our ministry.